I have finally got an opportunity to get some of my notes together and I will resume making videos for a QuickBook certification starting now, which is the end of uh, March, right in time for Easter. Um, so let's start section one. I've been ignoring your requests. I've just been so busy, but I'm back into it now. So let's do it. Section one, um, this is for the 2024 QuickBook Online Certification Exam. Um, I'm not sure where you're at at this point, if you've taken the exam already and you failed or this, you're just totally new to the process, I'm not sure. But in the video description, I will put this link here. And this link is for if you don't even have a QuickBook Online Accountant version yet and you need to create one, you can sign up for free on this. I will put this link inside the video description for you. That'll be the only link I'll provide. And um, all you'll do is click on that link and create that account. Um, so once you create that account, then you would need to go to the Pro Advisor tab and that's where you'll see their training. So I have mine up here. So this is my QuickBook Online account and I apologize, my internet's a little slow. I've moved um, to an area where I have to uh, use satellite. And so it's a little slow, I apologize. Um, but once that comes up, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a navigation pane and you'll see Pro Advisors right under your practice. It's the third one over. You come over here and you go to training. And then when you do that, that's when it'll bring you up into um, where you can do, uh, you can track your progress. You can have um, practice exams and there, there's videos and step-by-step -step training that's in the training library that's and then over here to the certification hub is where you'd click here and take your exam that's where you would go over here it would say take exam or resume exam if you're in it and the training library is where you would have um like the mapped out um modules for you to train on all the topics that are covered in the exam all right so as I said, the link to sign up for that will be in the video. So let's go ahead and look at what's new for 2024. Um, so something that's new is they have a banking option that you can um, invest your, your monies at 5% annual interest. Um, there's also bookkeeping automation for clients that have both plus or advanced subscriptions. There's financial planning. For your clients that have only advanced subscriptions, there's revenue recognition. And then for both plus and advanced clients, there's inventory count and initial costs. So I'll be going over these topics, not in this video, since this is just the certification and video, um, probably when we get further down in advanced. So let's look at the source here and subscription levels. Whenever I've done this, I always like to see what's the latest. And the latest for uh, QuickBook Online pricing is this. So we have the simple start, the essentials, the plus and advanced. Plus is the most commonly used one right now. These are the prices. If you go back to my very first video, if you remember, self-employment was like a dollar a month, something crazy low. Um, this is where we're at now. Uh, and these are the prices that they normally are, 30, 60, 90, and 200. But you would get a discount. And depending, we'll talk about that later, how your client pays for it um, depends on what they actually pay. So we'll look at that. And then the next link I have you looking at is um, the payroll. So you can have a payroll bundle or you can even do payroll alone. And if you were to go to this site, I'm not putting any of these links in the video, but you can just Google them. That's what I did. I Googled to get these links and then they talk about all the features. This is in the training section as well as you could just Google it yourself and have the tab up, let's say, while you're taking the exam if you need to reference it. So I'm going to, I just like to look at that. And as you saw, they list all the features associated with each subscription level. So you would look at that if you wanted to look at the different things covered under the different subscriptions. So here are some of the sample questions you may see in the certification exam pertaining to subscription levels. So here's one. Which two QuickBook Online subscription levels would support a client who needs, and I put this in because you it might be questioned differently, but you're basic, basically looking for anything that has profitability tracking and or creating budgets 
and or purchase orders. If you have any of those, then you would need to have either a QBO Plus or QBO Advanced. As you saw, there were other ones up there. One of them that's not up there anymore is self-employed, but there's other options, but they will not have these features. So if your client wants any of these features, you would need to have at least QBO Plus or Advanced. Advanced, you're looking at a larger number of uh, chart of accounts, um, employees, and so on. What are two QuickBook Online payroll subscription levels included in QuickBooks Time? So that was that second one I showed you in the three payroll subscription options. And for you to be able to get time, you would need to have the payroll subscription level elite or premium in order to get time. All right. What are the features QuickBooks Time Elite users have that premium users don't? So here are the four. Now, if I have four listed, that doesn't mean in the question there would be necessarily all four of them there. They might have one, two, three, or four. So you're going to want to have all of them in your notes. So the features that Time Elite has over premium would be ability to use geofencing, track project profitability, project estimates versus actual reporting, and timesheet signatures. I go over this extensively in the videos we cover on payroll. Uh, the next question would be, which are the main features and benefits of QuickBooks Online Payroll Premium? And the main features and benefits are QuickBook Time, Same Day Deposit, Same Day Direct Deposit, and the last one is Expert Review. Again, on those, those um, two links that I showed you, they have all those features down there for you. Okay, so if you wanted to take a picture or write them down in your notes, you could also do that and have that to reference while you take your exam. All right, the new client onboarding process. So Intuit wants bookkeepers like you to get certified in QBO in hopes you will encourage your current and future clients to use QuickBooks. Intuit has developed a form in Excel that you can use to help pinpoint a new client's needs and quickly identify the subscription plan that best is suited for them. With your first encounter with a client, which I call the initial onboarding meet and greet, you could pull this form out and walk them through each question while filling out the sections for them. Of course, you're going to want to critique the checklist file to your company's liking and adding or deleting any questions or sections that you offer or don't offer. So this is what the form looks like. And I actually have a video um, uh, that I cover on this particular form. It's called the new client checklist. And by the way, the file itself you can find in that section I showed you. So remember, I just showed you a second ago, if you have your QBOA account, which is free, you're going to sign up for it. You go over on the left-hand navigation, you go to pro advisor. And in the training section, it has those videos in one of those videos. When they discuss the new client checklist, they have their, the file for you to download. So the file can be found in the training section. And also I have a video in this channel called MS Excel 365 Basics 3, where I go over this particular file. So if you're interested, watch it. Um, I also teach um, a course on how to set up a small business from scratch using QuickBooks Online. It's a plus version. Um, it's a 10 chapter, 10 video course. So I encourage you to watch that if you're not familiar with QuickBooks. So if you're brand new with this, you're just dabbling and want to kind of get an idea of QuickBooks, or maybe you're an accountant that's going for your CPA, but you need to have a QuickBooks under your belt. You're not really um, savvy with bookkeeping. You might want to take this 10 chapter course just to kind of have the basics to make it easier for you to pass the certification exam and feel confident with using QuickBooks. And that's also in my videos on my channel. All right, so here are some sample questions you would see for the new client checklist. So here's the question. You and your new client just completed the client's needs assessment tool, which you know is really called the new client checklist. And the results showed that they would want profitability tracking, create budgets, and purchase orders. See that? I kind of highlighted that because you might see those terms in a lot of questions. When you see those terms, you know that you need to have at least QuickBook Online Plus. So either the answer is going to be QuickBooks Online Plus and or Advanced, because you would need at least one of those uh, uh, subscriptions to be able to get these features. Here's another question. What are the three areas the client needs assessment tool, which again is called the new client checklist, focuses on? So the three areas, and you see them at the bottom on the worksheets, 
There's client profile, features and solutions. I put in parentheses QuickBooks because that's where it tells you what subscription level is best suited for your client. That would be in the features and solution sections. And the last one is the needs assessment. And that's where you kind of look at the things that you're going to fulfill as their bookkeeper. How will your client pay for their new QBO account? So, I mean, QBO account. Um, so right now in the certification exam, they focus on these two, the pro advisor discount program and the direct discount program. Revenue share is something completely new. And so it isn't currently in any of the certification of questions. However, it is important for you still to know what it is because I'm sure it will soon be in there. And I'm positive, or I know for a fact, it's in the recertification questions. I'll talk about recertification at another time. But um, once you get certified, a year later, you have to get recertified. So as of right now, they don't have it, but you do want to have them in your notes because I think they're going to add them soon. And I'm not sure when you're watching this video. So now we have a third option for clients to pay, and that's revenue share. And I said, let's hear it from the source. So that means I have it here for you. And here's Pro Advisor Preferred Pricing. So if we scroll down, first they step you through how to set up as a Pro Advisor your client in order for them to have either the Pro Advisor discount or the direct discount. And that depends on whether you, if it's Pro Advisor discount, you, the firm, is going to pay it. Or if it's direct to I mean, direct discount, your client is going to pay it. And then if we scroll down, we see, oh, they got something new, and that's the revenue share. Now, if we scroll further down, it'll show you how much your costs are. And um, if you really go down, it has questions and answers and it talks about features. So again, if you want to know more about this, look this up. I don't know if you could see the link there, but all you have to do is Google it and it will um, take you to this and it'll give you all the features that go along with that. So this came straight out of the training section, and I know it's hard to read, but I'll read it for you. This is the first one, Pro Advisor Discount. And this is where you pay your client's subscription cost. All right. So I don't know if you could see it here, but it's the first selection, Pro Advisor Discount. And it just reminds you, this is where you get billed. You, the uh, bookkeeper or accountant firm, gets billed, and then you bill your client. So for this one, it's an ongoing discount. Your client gets now 30%. For those of you who've been in this business for a while, years ago it was 50%, but now it's 30% that they offer, as well as additional 15% off for any employee and contract fees. This is an ongoing discount that doesn't expire. But again, you pay for your client and you bill your client. The next one is the direct discount. And that's the second option. You see the third one is the new one I told you. This is the second option. And that is where your client pays their bill. So they get an, an initial 30-day free trial period. So that if they say they selected um, QBO Plus account, they'll come on, they'll get that for 30 days for free. Before the 30th day, your client must go on and enter their payment information in order for them to then get 12 months of 30% off. So remember those price, that price list I showed you, if they choose to go through you, they'll get a 30% discount for 12 months. If they choose not to go through you and they want to do it solely on their own, then they would go in. And if you remember, it said 50%, that's the deal they're offering right now. And that would only be for three months. So they would save a lot more money by going through you because they would have a whole year at 30% off. And then the last one is the new one. And it's still fairly new. So they don't have any questions on it in the certification exam, but I still want you to have it in your notes. And it is in the training section. It's called revenue share. And that's where, again, your client is built, not you. However, they still get a 30% discount, but they have an, an uh, um, I'm sorry, they have a 30-day free trial followed by a 50%, I apologize, 50% discount that expires after 12 months. And the main difference here is that you do not get QuickBook time with the revenue share. And that might be something that might change later, but right now you do not get that for free, the QuickBook time. So that would be the main difference. I had that as a question that I added on. So let's look at some of the questions we might see for client bill billing. 
After the second meeting with your client, they choose to have Intuit bill them directly. Which options has Intuit billing the client directly? So there's two. The answers would be direct discount and revenue share. But again, right now you might not see revenue share in there. So just know the answer would be direct discount. Here's another question. What are the two benefits of the ProAdvisor preferred pricing program? You have itemized bill for all firmed bill subscription. That means for you as the pro advisor, for you, the bookkeeper, you get itemized billing for all your firms. So that's your benefit as the pro advisor. And here's another one. You're going to offer 30% off subscriptions for all your clients, and that's ongoing. So those are the two benefits that you get as a pro advisor. What are the differences between the pro advisor preferred pricing program and the direct discount program? Well, one, the person gets billed, right? The client gets billed or the pro advisor gets billed. So the person that gets billed is the difference between these two because pro advisor preferred you, the pro advisor pays for direct discount, the client pays. The other one is the duration of the discount because for the pro advisor preferred, it's ongoing, but for the direct discount, it's 12 months. So those are the two differences between those two. As I said, they haven't been discussing the revenue share yet. So make sure you have those things in your notes when they do introduce those questions. They also have to which three subscriptions does the Pro Advisor Preferred Pricing Program apply? It applies for your QuickBook Online account, your QuickBook Time account, and your QuickBook Online payroll. And you might not know yet what the difference of QuickBooks Time and QuickBooks Online Payroll is. When I do my payroll videos, I have quite a few up there if you do want to look at them now. But now I'll be starting with new ones for 2024, and I'll get to that. You will understand the difference later. Um, which subscription does the Revenue Share Program not apply to? And that would be QuickBooks Time. Another question, what is necessary for you to do in order for your clients to be able to take advantage of the revenue share program? You as the bookkeeper must first enroll into the program in order to be able to offer it. So if you don't enroll, you can't offer it. All right, so now your client has created their QBO account. How are you or your client going to input the business information? So you can manually input the information for a brand new business, or you can import the information of an existing business. So if you choose to import, there's steps you need to do. First, you want to open up your spreadsheet, and that could be a CSV, an XLSX, or a Google Sheet file. You want to check it for accuracy. Then you want to double check your spreadsheet column titles and make sure that they're in row one. They can't be in row two. You can't skip down one. All well, the titles must be in row one, the very first one. And that they match up with the QBO setup for that section that you're importing into. And they'll tell you what the title should be. Then you also want to check the content, fill in any missing information, take out any unneeded information, and or correct any mistakes. The last thing you want to do is make sure your file doesn't exceed the two megabytes or the thousand row limit. If it does, then you'll need to split it up into different uploads. What are the steps to importing? You would go to the gear icon and then you go to import data. So when you go to the top right, matter of fact, I'll show you. you usually do. Let me do it. So here in the top right, you see the gear icon. And then under tools, you'll see import data. And you'll see there's a new one since my last video of this is journal entry. So you have bank data, customers, vendors, chart of accounts, product and services, invoices, and journal entry. All right. And the training section thoroughly covers this. Um, so I would encourage you to go in there and take notes in, in that section. All right. So here are some sample questions you'll see here. What list types can be directly imported into QuickBooks Online from Excel? I just showed you them. And I said, look, this one's new. So this might not even be in the questions. It might not be in the answers for this current certification year in 2024. You'll see probably chart of accounts, customers, vendors, and products and services. You might not see bank data, but have that in your notes. You might not see invoices. And you probably certainly aren't going to see journal entries, but have them all in your notes. Um, when importing lists into QuickBooks Online, which section allows you to opt for overriding duplicate names? That would be product and services. So the answer would be something like you can choose to override product and service items with the same name. I'll talk about that again a little later, but that just right now is the only one that allows you to do overwriting and updating. All right. When importing files into QBO, what file types can you use? Any spreadsheet files like CSV, Google Sheets, XLS or XLSX. So 
I've seen these questions in different with different type of uh, answers. Just have all of them there. The next one, if a new client has been using QuickBooks Online Desktop to manage their books and now plans to switch to the online version, what would you as a pro advisor bookkeeper do? What's the best method? The best method to uh, upload it is by using the conversion tool. And that will convert existing QuickBook Online desktop data, which is extremely easy now compared to the initial steps. And the last question, which ways can new information be inputted, inputted um, for a new QBOA a company? It can be inputted manually, or you can go to the gear icon and select import, as I showed you a second. All right, the first import, the first step in creating your business would be your chart of accounts, and I'm going to call that COA. And that's an index or a list of all the financial accounts that are used by your company. And it basically comprises your general ledger. You're, um, you don't want to start importing any business transactions before setting up your COA. So your COA is usually your very first thing that you're going to put in. And usually when you have your Google Sheets or Excel file, you want to make sure you have these headings. Also note, you cannot import a sub account. Put this in blue. I know there was a question. I think they took it out, but it was something similar where it said, "What could you not import?" And um, it was subaccount. Put it in your notes. I don't think it's a question that I've seen any time here recently. Um, when setting up your chart of accounts, it's the first essential step in setting up your new company setup. Um, I have it in my chapter two. Remember, I told you earlier I have a ten video showing you how to create a new business, um, create a new QBO with a new business. Um, it's my chapter two. And I thoroughly go over setting that up. So you can look at that if you don't, if you're not familiar with that. And it's also covered in the training. Um, there's two ways you can access, assess your, um, access your COA. In the left-hand navigation pane, I'll show you that real quick. Since over here, you can come down here and go to accounting. Where is it at? More. I know, I don't know if you could see all of it because um, uh, it's, uh, I know the lettering is so little. In the left-hand navigation pane, you can go down to accounting, or you can go to the gear icon and go to a chart of accounts. So that's the two ways. I don't know if you can see. I can hardly see, so you probably can't see. I think I have my percentage down kind of low as well, so I apologize for that. Um, here are two. Oh, I think I just answered. That's the very first question. What are the two ways to access your chart of accounts? You go to the gear icon and go to chart of accounts, or you can go to the left navigation pane. And then you'll see accounting, and then you go to chart of accounts. Um, a client needs you to clean up their chart of accounts to reduce the number of accounts shown because they have several duplet accounts and accounts that are not being used. What can you do to fix this issue? You could do one of two things or both, so have both of them in your notes. Make accounts inactive. So if you're not using one of them and you're only using the other one, make that one inactive. It does. If it does have a balance, you need to close that out or you need to merge it. If it has a balance and you're going to do the merge you want to merge duplicate accounts and then it will get rid of the other one and merge them together um where can you enable account numbers for the chart of accounts you would go to the gear icon you'd go to accountant settings and you go to the advanced tab and that's where you'd be able to enable having account numbers for your chart of accounts before merging two sub accounts which two of these need to be true you would need to make sure that the name is spelled the same and that you have the same parent account and the last one in the chart of accounts, what is the minimum number of characters that are allowed in the number field for your number associated with each account? The um, the maximum, sorry, the maximum number is seven. You have up to seven numbers that you can use. Uh, when in um, the chart of accounts, how can several accounts be inactivated or made inactive all at once? By selecting each account and then choosing make an active from the batch action dropdown. I showed you that in the last video, so I won't show that again. Um, and then the last question is when in the chart of accounts, you may need to merge several. Which accounts cannot be merged? And that would, there's a couple of them, but um, retained earnings and uncategorized. When you see uncategorized, it can be uncategorized expenses or uncategorized income, so have them all there. So uncategorized accounts and your retained earnings, those two cannot be uh, merged with anything else. They also can't be deleted, they must be there. Um, now we're looking at customers, vendors, product services, uh, banking data, and invoices. Those are other things that can be imported. Um, usually you do it in this order, customers, vendors, product and services, and invoices, but we're gonna look at product and service first because that's our special one. 
So usually for me, the next thing I do is look at products and services. Um, again, if you look at my videos, I think it's chapter three that we start with product and services. There's four categories and these are them. There's inventory and that's where you're tracking the quantity sold and bought. Okay. Non-inventory is probably for items that you're not necessarily tracking or something unique to your business. You don't sell them a lot. Uh, the next one is service. That's like if you're a doctor or tutor, pro advisor, dentist. And a bundle is when you have both products and services. Um, and they also go over different um, examples inside the training section. In order to show product service columns on your sales form, like your invoices, your sales receipts, you would need to go to your gear icon and in your accountant settings, you would go to the sales tab. So I don't know if you can see this here, but here's, I'm in my accountant settings page. I'm going to go down to the sales tab. When I click on it, the first area is going to be product and service. And the very first line says show product service column on your sales firm. And you're just going to take this and slide it off to the right so that it's yes, it's positive, it's on. The next thing it'll pop up, show SKU column, and that's yes or no. All right. When you go to that gear icon to import your data, let's say we're going to select product and service. So I went to the gear icon, import. Those seven things, green things came up. I'm going to click on product and services. When I do that, this pops up and it says import product and services and I'm going to click browse. I'm going to go to the file that has the thousand or less um, products and services. I'm going to click open. Okay. And then what's going to happen is it's going to say import product and services. It's going to have a list here. And this is where I'm going to first map your fields to the QuickBook fields. So we're going to make sure that remember we were saying in column one is where you have all your titles. So all of those need to match up. You see, I'm clicking this button. Yes, yes, yes. It's matching up to the QuickBook fields, right? And then you're going to upload it. We're going to be able to look at it here. And this is what's really um, unique about product and services. You have the option here, once it's uploaded, to update or modify your product and service list by merging or removing any unused ones. So if you have any duplicate ones, at the bottom, you can select override all values. Okay, and then you would upload. So that's what's kind of unique about product and services. And you see a couple of questions like that. Here's my first one. Which existing list records can be updated when the new information is brought in via importing? And that would be product and service. That's how they're unique because you can do some updating while you're uploading it. Where within QuickBooks Online would you set up the show product service column on your sales form? That's where you went to gear and icon accounts and settings, then you went to the sales section and the product and services. That's where you pushed it over and selected that you want to show that product service column on your sales form. Your client has contacted you because they can't add a product or service to their invoice. What might have caused this? Well, there's two. You might have turned off inventory, like you don't want to track inventory, or you might have turned off that setting to show product and services in the sales form. So these, either one of these can be. So it might be one or both. So have them both in your notes. Here's another question. So it's a big, large question, and they show different prompts. Like this is an example. So let's look at this. It says these products are bought and sold where it isn't necessary to track quantities on hand. So such as small parts used for installation. We're not tracking the quantity, therefore it's non-inventory. And then it had to click down and you select which one would be non-inventory. So it would be a unique product requested by a customer. The next one is an example of a bundle. A bundle would be like a roofer who provides services as well as materials. That's that bundle, product and services. A service person would be like a doctor, a lawyer, a QuickBook Pro advisor, a tutor. So you would come down, oh, maybe it's not this that you're selecting, and maybe it's this you're selecting, or maybe you're selecting the actual answer. You just have all of these in your notes. If you have all of these in your notes, when you get this question, you'll know what the answer is. And the last one, which I didn't go over, was if you are tracking quantities of products that you sell, then you would want to select inventory. Just note that's only covered under plus and advanced subscriptions. And an example of somebody who would use inventory would be a retailer like a clothing store, Walmart, or any e-commerce business. Here's some more questions. If a client does not want to track quantity on hand of a product they sell, what product service type should they select when they're setting up their item? That would be non-inventory. In QuickBooks Online, the product and service list contains the items that will appear on your client's purchase, um, purchase and sales transactions. Which of each of these product service items must be mapped to 
Again, I go over this thoroughly with that class. While we're setting up, you're going to see you have to tie your inventory item to a cost of goods sold. You have to tie it to a revenue account and all of that and, and an inventory account, that would be chart of account. So you would need to select from the chart of account what other account it's tied to because every time you sell a product, you're going to affect those items, the cost of goods sold, inventory, and revenue. Importing customers and vendors. So um, you would use the same steps of importing, as I mentioned earlier, with going to the gear icon and then going to import. But the difference is if you have a duplicate customer or vendor, instead of just allowing you to just simply change it, instead there will be an error message, which will prompt you to either change the name or choose not to import. You'd have to go back to that file and manually change the file, save it, and then try to import it again. So here are some questions for customer and vendor. You have a client who wants to use purchase order forms, which is true about using a product or service item on a purchase form. You must select, I purchased this product service from a vendor when setting it up. And then you must also be using QuickBook Online Plus or Advanced, because remember that's how you do the in tracking inventory. What does QuickBooks Online do if you try to import a customer that already exists in the company? It'll display that error message we just talked about, which will prompt you to either change the name or choose not to import it and change the file. What two reports can be filtered by customer type? That would be customer contact list and sales by customer type detail. What must you select in order to remove a vendor from the vendor center in QuickBooks Online? You would have to make it inactive. Um, you wouldn't really be able to just remove it, but it will remove from the pop-up if you make it inactive. Where is the vendor center accessed in QuickBooks Online? You'd go to the left-hand navigations, you'd go to expenses, and then select vendor. Which batch actions can be performed in the customer center in QuickBooks Online? When you go to the customer center, you can go to create statements, email, make an active, or select customer type, or it also, I guess, could be considered assign customer type. So these are those four. Create statements, email, make it active, or inside assign customer type. This next one I want to show you because we kind of had a thing going back and forth last time I did um, section one of the QBO certification exam. People were saying they just didn't see one of these options. So I think maybe it might be the wording in this question. So I want to show you what they're talking about. So it says, what two actions can be performed on a vendor in the vendor center in QuickBooks Online? So instead of just going over the type of answer you might see here, I'm gonna show you the vendor center. So if we come over here, we go to expenses. It's so small myself, I can hardly see. And we go to vendors. This is gonna, this is your vendor center, okay? And you have, your vendors are gonna pop up in a second. My internet is a little slow. It'll have a list of my vendors. And depending if I have a balance or not, it's gonna change what my actions are. So here are my vendors. And you see this one, I have a zero. So under under the action column, these are my my the following things. I could do create an expense, write a check, create a purchase order, or make inactive. Those are my options. Now I can't do the same thing for this um, client, this uh, vendor, because this vendor I owe money to. So for this vendor, all I can do is create a bill or create an expense. I can't make this vendor inactive because I owe him money. Okay. So those are the you, I read out the ones that you can. So make sure you wrote those down as options. But the other thing I could do is I can double click on any vendor, and I have a few more options. I can edit or merge, and I'm gonna show you that in a second once it comes up because my internet, there we go. So I can come over here, if I click edit, it's gonna show me um, the, everything that I, all the input I put in for this on the right hand side, or I can come down here under edit and go in the drop down, and I can make it inactive or merge contacts. So again, you see I have edit options. If I click edit, I'll show you everything I've ever inputted is here and I can override it. I have, if I scroll down, I have my ICH payments. I have my tax information. So this is where I would input my bank information or I put my tax information there. So I just wanted to show you this so you can visualize it. Those are all the things you can do under your vendor center. Also know when you're taking your exam, although you can't look at your QBOA account, you can have maybe a separate um, computer on the side where you can access, um, again, if you go back to my class, ch chapter one, there's uh, 
Craig's Landscaping and Design. It's um, a test drive that they allow you to play with a free QBO Plus account. It's an existing account that they change all the time. You can have that up and, and play with it and look at the vendor center and see what you can do as well if you don't have it in your notes. And the last two things I wanted to look at, or the last thing, the last two slides is the overview screen. So the overview, t overview tab appears at the top of the menu sidebar when you log into a client's file. So you, the QuickBook and Online accountant, is logging into your client's file. And you'll see this. You'll see overview, and then you'll see client overview. It looks a little different on our end. I'll show you that in a second. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It's also available to all company administrators. They also, for those that have the QuickBook Online advanced subscription level, those administrators can also... Um, access the client overview. So if you go into the client overview, that's where you'll be able to see different sections. And I'll show you that real quick. I'll show from us. I'm going to the client overview. And then there's different sections. There's the company setup. And in the company setup, that's where you would see the apps. That's basically at this level, the only question you'll see. And you'll have the subscription, the apps, and then you have banking activities, common issues. These are things we'll look at if you decide to get certified in advance. Um, the advanced certification, not here. We wouldn't go into too much depth of the overview. The only questions you might see for overview would be like this. Who has access to the overview screen? Accountant users and advanced company administrator users. And the other question is, what four sections on the overview screen can be used to perform a high level review? That was the company setup, banking activity, common issues, and transaction volume. That's all they would do in a question. They would only ask you for the sections. They wouldn't get go into depth because that's something we look at in advanced certification. So I'm going to end this video here. Oh, wait, I have one more. I apologize. I do have one more. Where can a pro advisor see which apps are connected to their client's account from within the client's um, a, a QBO company? You can go to the overview company setup. I just actually showed it. If you go to the overview and company setup, you will see um, your apps. And then you can also see um, subscriptions, advanced users. So that's what they were asking here. Where would you see it? And also advanced company administrator users are, have access to that as well. All right. So I'm going to stop it here. Um, I hopefully in the next, I'm going to say two weeks, we'll have section two, maybe even sooner, but it is uh, Easter this week and I have family come over. I'll get section two out as soon as possible. And I'm going to back up and I'm going to get these uh, certification uh, videos out. Thank you for watching. And in the comments, if you have any questions, concerns, or anything to add, please um, make a comment and I will uh, respond. Thank you.